Welcome to Pecan Baptist Church. Our vision and purpose is to love God, love others, introduce people to Jesus Christ, and watch them grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, helping them as they lead their friends and family to Christ. We pray that this message will bring you into a closer relationship with God and help you as you live the life He has given to you. Well, last week we looked at a prophecy about the last days, and it was in 2 Peter, and we saw that in 2 Peter it predicted the prominence of naturalism that that would come about, and then it also pronounced that judgment is coming, that a lot of the world kind of is asleep in regard to that judgment is coming. And we're going to be looking at another last days prophecy this week in 2 Timothy. Now these Often you can view these prophecies as not really good news because they're not telling us good things about the time in which we live, but at the same time they're an encouragement to me and a reminder that God is in control. He said these things would take place, and perhaps while watching the news my head just won't blow smooth off, right? (laughs) So we don't have to like it, but we have to understand that God is still in control. He is in charge of the nations, and he said that these things must take place but do not fear. So what we are given the task to do in the middle of all of this mess that we live in is to remember that we have a purpose to serve and that we have a purpose and God has us here for a reason and in the middle of all the chaos and the insanity that we provide a glimpse of light into this dark world. So we can't lose focus on those things. Don't be deceived that, you know, that government or politics or any of those things are the answer the answer is the lord jesus jesus is the answer jesus and just because he tarries he tarries in patience because he's hoping that more will come to salvation obviously but just because he tarries doesn't mean he's not coming we know that he is now in second timothy chapter 3 starting in verse 1 but realize this that in the last days, difficult times will come. So guys, we live in the last days. We live in a time which is considered to be difficult. And so since we live in such a difficult time, I mean, sure, in life there are great difficulties, but there are also great blessings. But in difficult times, what do we do? You know, what shall we do? And here's the description of these difficult times. For men will be lovers of self... And lovers of money. Now, that fits, doesn't it? Fits to a T. But you could also say that that fits to a T of any, any generation. Men will be lovers of self and lovers of money. Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. That, that's some list, isn't it? Unloving. Now, remember what Christ said about the Laodicean church. He's He said, no, what he said about the end times, he said, the love of many will grow cold. And even the church at Laodicea, which is the seventh period in church history, is characterized by being lukewarm. So again, here again, we see the same thing. Unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good. Paul doesn't think much of the time in which we live, does he? Well, actually, Paul here isn't giving an opinion at all. What he's stating is facts, facts that were so distant in the future that I wonder if people even considered them in the past. Maybe maybe they thought some of these things applied to the age in which we live. I mean, I told you that Christ left it with us with a sense of eminence, that it could be any time. But when we look at these prophecies, we understand, wow, The time is getting close. Now, we're not a predictor of time. Anybody that predicts the timing of the rapture, the timing of the coming, is going to be wrong. It will come at an hour when no one suspects it. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, that fits to perfection. Our culture and the age in which we live, isn't it? Pleasure above all else. Pleasure. Pleasure first. Do what first pleases you. And do you understand that comes from a godless society? Paul said himself, is there is, if there is no resurrection, then let us eat, drink, be merry, and die. Because if there is no resurrection and there is no God, then all there is is pleasure. Life is about pleasure. That's it. 
So do we blame the unbelievers for living out what is most sensical? We don't. If they believe they are glorified animals, then they will behave like glorified animals. What they need to be taught is they are not animals. They are made in the very image of God, and they are going to be held accountable to God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now there's a kind of a switch here now, and I believe it kind of switches looking to something that is prominent in the last days. In verse 5, it says, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. So now what power is he talking about? They hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, as it says in King James. So what are they talking about? What is the only thing that really has power? God is the one who has power. And we, as Christians, through God, also have power. But they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So what power is it talking about? This has to be fake Christianity. It has to be what that is. Because Christianity, true Christianity, the Christian, through God, is the only one that truly has power. God is the only one that truly has power. So in this last time, is fake Christianity prominent? Well, if you take a poll of the United States... The majority of the people in the United States, there's about 300 million now, so a majority would be greater than 150 million. Actually, it's like 60 or 70 percent will claim to be Christians. So that would be about 200 million people claim to be Christians. But if you take another poll and ask how many believe that Jesus came out of that tomb, the number is much, much lower so how is it they claim to be Christians, but yet they don't believe in the resurrection? How is that even possible? Well, they're in Christians in name only. They're Christians. They call themselves Christians, but they deny the power thereof. What is the power thereof? Well, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. You are promised the resurrection like Christ, the power of God that raised Jesus out of that tomb. That's the power, the power of the blood of Jesus to, so that we can have forgiveness of sins. That's the power that's being denied. There are many people in Christian and name only, and if they, that is one of you in here today, you can fix that problem here today by your own volition, your own decision to become a follower of Jesus and trusting him for your salvation, but you have to believe. You can't deny the power thereof. You must believe in the resurrection. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. You must believe in that empty tomb. You also must believe that you are fallen in nature. You have a sin nature, and you cannot save yourselves. So I was looking, thinking about these Christians in name only, and I kind of broke it down into two categories. I broke it down into heritage Christians. Some of the 200 plus million in the United States, I, I would call them heritage Christians. They grew up in a Christian home. They grew up in a Christian church. They grew up in a Christian nation, a Christian community. Well, I've always been a Christian. Well, now, I'm not one of those preachers that thinks you have to have a date and time of the moment of your decision to be a believer in Jesus. That's not what I'm saying at all. But your heritage isn't going to save you. At some point in your life, you have to accept it, the faith, as your own. Be a believer. Become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a personal decision. Look at John chapter 8, starting at verse 39. Jesus dealing with these Pharisees, okay? And he's kind of in a discussion with them. And they tell him, verse 39, They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. So now what are they trusting in? It's the same thing. They're trusting in their heritage. They're trusting in their Jewish heritage, where many Christians in name only are trusting in their Christian heritage. But what does Jesus tell them about this? If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has just told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, look at this, we were not born of fornication, what do you think they mean by that? 
Do you think they've looked into Jesus' path? Do you, does it sound like to you they believe in the virgin birth, for example? They're saying Mary, Mary and Joseph were fornicators, and therefore Jesus cannot be the Son of God. He is cursed. They believed that. That was a cultural thing. We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Look at this. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So now how far do you think their Jewish heritage is going to take them? Not far enough. That's the answer. Not far enough. If they were of their father, the devil, where are they going to be at the time of judgment? Not where they need to be. That's the answer. It is only by Jesus Christ that you can stand before the judgment of God. Because the standard is absolutely perfection. And so their Jewish heritage isn't going to save them. They need to make a decision for Christ. That's the difference. So your Christian heritage isn't going to save you. Now, growing up in a Christian home, a Christian church, Christian community, Christian nation, what an advantage, what an advantage that is to coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but you still have to make your own decision. So the other group I think about are ones that are depending on their, depending on their own righteousness. You say, surely there's no one like that now. Well, oftentimes if you ask people, if you were to die today, why should God let you into heaven? That question reveals a lot. I'm better than most. I do good things. I, I go to church. I'm a good person. What are all those things? That has nothing to do with their salvation. All has fallen short of the glory of God. None of those things will save a person. Turn now with me to Matthew chapter 23. Dealing with some of these same people, Matthew chapter 23, 23 and 24. Jesus is scolding the Pharisees and the scribes again. Now, I'm not giving you the whole scolding because it's pretty, it's pretty lengthy. The eight woes, I'm picking out one of them because I want to show you something, what Jesus says about them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. This is verse 23. Hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? He's not denying that they don't do really good things. He's not denying that they're trying to follow the law to the nth degree. That is the nth degree. They're going to that extent to make sure they take 10% of this little bit of tithe or little bit of mint or cumin they get out of their garden to make sure they do it exactly right. Boy, that is the definition of a do-gooder right there. Why should God let you into heaven? Well, I even tithe of the tenth of the spices of my garden. Wow, that's impressive. And have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, Jesus is angry right there, and rightly so, but that's just funny. Because what they would do, they would take their drink or whatever, and they were so scared of swallowing a gnat because it was unclean that they would strain every, all of their drinks to make sure they didn't accidentally take anything unclean into their mouth without knowing it even. You see how what trouble they're going to? But yet they're swallowing a camel. That's funny. Well, it's not funny, but it's funny, right? All right, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going, I just kept going backwards. I really was aiming at a verse further down the page, but I just kept going backwards. In verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. 
So what they would do, they would get salt from the Dead Sea, and it had sand and other stuff, shells and other stuff mixed in with the salt. Well, how do you get the salt out? Well, salt dissolves in water. Well, eventually there's no salt left. All there is is debris that's left. And so what do you do with that? Well, it's only fit to be thrown out in the street, to be trampled underfoot. And Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth. So if it has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Now, salt back then was very useful. It was useful for making things taste better in your food, but it also was a preservative. So it was very important and very useful. Look, in verse 14, he continues with the same idea. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand and gives it light to all who are in the house. Look at that. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We can get so distracted by everything that's going on in this messed up world that we forget our purpose. Our purpose is to shine our light in this dark world. And the darker it gets, the easier it is to shine. It's difficult times, certainly. But don't lose your focus on what our purpose really is. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think, look at this is interesting, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And that's exactly what it, what it is. The law that the Pharisees are trying so hard to follow to the nth degree all pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It all pointed to him. It was all about him. And he came to fulfill the law, to complete it. So it's not necessary anymore. When the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. We no longer have to follow the law. We are not under the law. We are not under the condemnation of the law because he has set us free from that. Man, I'm glad I don't have to tithe from the spices of my garden, which I don't have one this year. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, are you ready for this? I say to you, and let your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is where the crowd gasps. Thank you. (laughs) We didn't even plan that out. You were just a touch late. Who did that? It was Emily, my daughter. (laughs) Yes, that is where the crowd gasps. Because, look, they all know Nobody, nobody follows the law more completely than the Pharisees that they know of. Following the law to that degree is more than a full-time job. Joseph cannot be, go, be doing carpenter things and fulfill the law completely like the Pharisees because it is a full-time job, just keeping up with all the laws, the little details, and all of that that has to be kept. So the crowd's like, Well, how is that even possible? You see what Jesus is doing here? He's telling them, you can't make it on your own. You know, if your answer, if you thought, you know what? Why would God let you into heaven? Well, I'm better than most. Are you better at keeping the law than the Pharisees? Are you better than most? Well, that's not good enough. What Christ is saying here, not even the Pharisees are good enough. There's only one way, and it's perfection. And the one speaking here is making a point. The only way to make it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. No amount of do-gooding will get you there. You know, maybe your thought is, well, why do we do good at all? You know, we're supposed to be do-gooders too. But we do good as a response to our salvation. If you're still trying to earn your salvation, you need to let it go. You are not under the law. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Trust him for your salvation. That is the only way. You know, in the book of Revelation, they all come before the great white throne judgment, all the unbelievers. And there's two books that are open. One is the book of actions, 
which many of you guys are going to have some actions in that book, but you're not going to come before the great white throne, I hope, if you're not depending on those. But did you know at the great white throne judgment, they look at those book of actions, and then it says another thing about the other book that's there. No one, no one made it unless their name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Not one of them made it. You know, if you're in here depending on your own righteousness, your own goodness, your own actions, can I just tell you, you're not going to make it. No one makes it. Not even the Pharisees could make it. The only way is by the forgiveness of sins, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All right, back to our primary text, text in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We just looked at the verse, holding to a form of righteousness or religion, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, we are to be in the world, but not to be of the world. So when it talks about avoiding them, avoid them as teachers, avoid them as influences to you. For among them are those, look at this, I think this is switching to teachers now in the last time. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. How many Christian leaders and preachers have fallen into sexual sin in the last, well, in my lifetime? How many? Could anybody even count? Maybe you have counted. You need something better to do. But the point is, in the last time, sexual sin is going to be a huge problem. It's always been a huge problem. But it's especially going to be a problem in the church now, in the past 50 years, and continuing forward. But it's also a problem. Guys, do not fall into that temptation. It is a destroyer of families, a destroyer of churches, and henceforth, a destroyer of nations. Don't fall into that temptation. I've known people that's gone down that path and destroyed everything. It's not worth it. Look at what it also says about them. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, what truth is being talked about? What we've already been talking about, the gospel is the truth. It's the only truth that truly matters. Not the only, that's not true. It's the only, the most important truth. The greatest decision you can ever make in your life is decide to follow the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe in him. To always learning, but never coming to the truth, never coming to the saving knowledge. I believe there are Christian books, Christian authors out there that you could read a book of theirs a month. And if you weren't a believer, I don't think you could, you probably would never come to the saving knowledge of the truth. You would find out a lot of things about perhaps self-help. Be the best you now, that type of thing. Now, there are a lot of good Christian authors out there, but I'm just saying right now, it's very prevalent. There is a lot of false teaching out there. Fluff preachers. And guys, i tell you how to detect a false teacher in these ages because they use the Bible. They take Scripture and use the Scripture, and they're very good at it. But it's what they leave out. It's what you don't hear that you have to notice. So they don't talk about repentance. They don't talk about the wickedness of the human heart and the need for Jesus to save them in that way. They don't talk about those. They don't talk about the blood of Jesus. They don't talk about those things. So they're leaving out that stuff. Well, how, what are you being saved from if you're not being saved from the wickedness of your heart, your fallen nature? What are you being saved from if, if you don't have to repent and turn? Do you need saving at all? See, never, always learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Let's move down just a little bit to chapter 4.
Paul talking to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Encourage only, do nothing else. That's not what it says. And out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. What he's saying is, preach the full counsel. And you have to be willing to receive the full counsel. You know, if all of you rose up tomorrow and decided, you know what? That was really discouraging. He told us we were sinners. He told us we couldn't make it on our own. And every one of you left next week, I would be here by myself. You know what? I can't pay for this building and all of these ministries that we do by myself. See, it is you. It is you, the body, and all of us together that make this whole thing work. Look at what it says in the next verse. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. So all these preachers that are getting rich, who's making them rich? Well, they chose that. It's the people who are making them rich. Do you see what the Bible says? It's not God making them rich. God is not making them They have six jets. God didn't bless them with six jets. People are wanting their ears tickled, and the people are making them rich. Man, I tell you, that is a... In this age of the world, I'm not talking about from God's point of view, but that is a fantastic career path, being a false teacher. You imagine going to your counselor and say, what do you want to do? I'm going to be a false teacher. There's a lot of money in false teaching. All I have to do is tickle people's ears, and they'll just come and pay me tons of money, and I can fly around in jets and live a lavish lifestyle. False teaching, that is a fantastic, that's way better than engineering. I'm glad I didn't choose it, though. Now, doesn't that fit the time at which we live? So what do we, what do, we do about it? That's frustrating to see people getting rich off the gospel, like when they're not even teaching the full counsel, they're not talking about the blood of Jesus. That's frustrating. Well, that's God's problem. What do you do? Don't support those ministries. That's all you can do. If you have friends, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth of the word of God. That's all we can do. Look at verse 4. Okay, the people accumulate teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now, that had to be a mystery for a long What myths is that? Well, guys, we're living in the last days. We can now fill in those blanks to what those myths are. And I just wrote a few of them down. Everyone's going to be okay. Well, I've read the ending. Everyone is not okay. That's what the full council says. Only people whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are going to be okay. So that is a lie. That is a myth. There are multiple pathways to God. That's a lie. Jesus said it clearly that he was the only way. In the book of Revelation at the great white throne judgment, what is the only way? Being in the Lamb's book of life. So that is a lie. The word of faith movement. You just speak it into existence, whatever you want. Just say it, and it is. You had the same creative power in you as when God spoke the universe into existence. You say it, you believe it, it's yours. God is a genie in a bottle to do whatever is at your beckoning. That's a lie. That's a myth. We are subject to God. He is not subject to us. Now, does God work miracles? Absolutely God works miracles. He does it all the time. But he doesn't do it according to our will. He does it according to his will. Relativism of truth. Don't buy into that. 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is a truth out there. The abundant life equals health and wealth. That's a lie. Now, God may bless us with those things, and that's fantastic, but that's not the abundant life. The abundant life is living out the purpose that God has called us to live. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the prize at the finish line, that's the abundant life. Carrying out the purpose he made for you. You know, sometimes God lines up a a bed of suffering for us. Could be as a result of discipline. Could be as a result so you could have an impact on your sphere of influence. You know, ironically, Paul, writing this, which is probably, obviously outside of Christ, Paul was probably the one who lived out Christianity the most that I've ever known or ever seen. But Paul was neither what might be considered healthy or wealthy. So beware. There's a lot of false teachers out there. Do not support those ministries. The people make those men. I mean, they are responsible for themselves. But if nobody showed up and nobody gave them anything, they wouldn't have a platform. Don't support them. Now, turning back, what's the answer? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look, this is really interesting here. Starting in verse 14. You, however, okay, this is talk, he's talking about all this bad stuff, right? And then he tells Timothy, you, however... Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. So that's the same message to us today. Right? Timothy was told about these times, how bad they would be and how difficult they would be, how frustrating they would be. And then he says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that, look at this, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writing. Timothy grew up in a Christian home. Like many of us. Look at what it says. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So he was raised with the sacred scriptures. He was raised in a Christian home. But at some point, he came to a saving knowledge, so to speak. He made his own personal decision to follow. And that's where his righteousness comes from, is by faith. In verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the Word of God is the answer, which is obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us the Word of God. He lived out the Word of God. He is the very Word of God. By Him, everything is created and sustained by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, perhaps, guys, we do a lot of things with our time during the week, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps, just perhaps, if the Word of God is that important and that powerful, that it leads to the knowledge of salvation and leads to salvation, and then yet it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, all those things, perhaps we we should spend more time in the Word of God than we do watching the news or other activities. I'm not decrying don't watch the news. I'm not saying don't do other activities. But the Word of God is that important, especially so now. Because don't you think in a time, in difficult times like these that we live, that there are influences all around us in the other direction? You've heard me say it before. We don't just go stagnant as a Christian. We're either moving forward or moving backwards. We're growing closer to Christ or we're shrinking further away. The Word of God is amazing. We need to be equipped for every good work in this wicked, difficult time in which we live. Now to the unbeliever, believe in God. Believe in the resurrection. Don't trust in your own works. Don't trust in your own goodness, your own good actions. 
Don't trust in your Christian heritage. You're not being questioned about your heritage or any of those things. The book of actions are going to be looked at. But again, if your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, you're not going to make it. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. It is your decision. Yours alone. Your parents, your grandparents can't make that for you. It is your decision. And it has eternal impacts. Recognize. You have a fallen nature. Recognize you're a sinner. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, no one can make it without the Lord Jesus Christ. What is it the scripture says? The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can even know it? Without the Lord, you're going to end up entirely wicked. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Begin a path of growing and discipleship in the Lord and being transformed by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Begin a path towards Jesus. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Call on the name of the Lord. Save me, Lord. Save me from myself. I cannot make it on my own. I believe in God. I believe in the resurrection. Believers, be encouraged. Don't let your heads blow smooth off this week watching the news. Right? Get into the word. Understand that in this fallen, messed up world, we have a purpose to carry out in your sphere of influence. Don't forget it. What a shame it would be. We have a light. We have the light of the gospel. Don't hide the light. Live it out. Set it on a lampstand for the world to see. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries of Pecan Baptist Church, go to our website at www.pecan.church or call 682-205-1565. We're located in Granbury, Texas. Services are each Sunday at 10 a.m.